This is Mom Pat, and we are going to be talking, answering some questions that you've sent in on marriage. And the first one we're going to start with is, what are some keys to a happy marriage? She's been married for over 60 years, 63 almost, so keys to a happy marriage. Oh, that's a big question. I wonder how many keys we'll find today. Um, <laughs> Keys to a happy marriage. I think the one thing that is most important of all, don't marry somebody that you don't love. Love. You, you know, you may not like everything they do because opposites attract, but you must love them because love wins out and all of those dislikes, they'll fall off after a while. And... Um, that's what I would say, number one, love each other. And then I would say respect. And kind of in this order, I think so far, respect. Because if you don't respect each other, you can't go to the next key. And that is communications. You know, one of the, one of the spouses is probably going to not want ever to talk about things. They are, they, they're afraid or they're concerned. We're not fearful, but they're concerned that it's going to cause a disagreement. So, but there'll be one in the marriage that won't want to just leave it alone. They're going to want to communicate and understand. And I happen to have been that one, so I understand. I wanted to understand, I, I'm, I kind of vowed to myself, not really, but as I look back, I've always, I just wasn't going to tuck everything back in me. You know what happens if you do that? Finally, it's like if you're uh, stacking a load on a horse and you keep putting things on him, you keep putting more weight on him, more weight, there's finally going to be something that's so little that you'll put on him and it'll fall. That horse can't stand any longer. And so it would be, I found in my life, that if I just kept putting things on and on and on me and hiding them back in me, I could be like a volcano one day. I would just erupt out of nowhere. It looked like it was everything was very peaceful, but suddenly there could be an eruption. And so I had learned and have learned just to communicate, but communication is something you have to learn. There has to be the proper time. You can't just, even though you've been thinking about something all day long, as soon as he walks in the door or you walk in the door, you can't just let it all hang out. Start saying everything that's on your mind. You have to wait till the proper time, and you have to package it the right way. Don't be accusive. Some of us, it, we just, and that makes them very defensive, and it makes them clam up, and they don't want to talk. So be careful with your timing and your uh, packaging. And those are two very important things. Now, I don't know if I'm going to keep these all in order, but love and uh, respect and, Rhonda, you're going to have to help me too, communication if I forget. Because there gets to be a lot of keys in making a marriage successful. You know, there's a scripture in the Bible that says, prefer the other over yourself. John and I really do that. And we've done that all the way back when we were very young because we loved each other so much. We wanted to make the other one happy. And sometimes we'd go along with something. We used to go to drive-in movies long ago. And if he thought, if I thought he wanted to see this, then yes, that's a good one to go to. But if he 
thought I wanted to see something different. So we did that so long that we finally realized we were just pacifying the other whenever neither one of us was really getting what we wanted. So sometimes you can prefer each other to a fault. You have to be true to yourself. You have to, in a right kind of packaging, say what you like and say what he likes. Him to say what he likes. And then maybe it's right in the middle. Maybe you go here first and then you go there. Maybe you wanted to go have an ice cream and maybe, let's put it this way, maybe I wanted to go have the ice cream because I'm the sweeter, sweet eater. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, let's go do this first and then we'll get our ice cream. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a little behind the scenes. We lived in Florida. This is way back in, say, uh, 56, 57. And uh, we didn't have air conditioning cars then. We didn't. There probably was around, but we didn't have them. And so we'd stop at this little ice cream place. You know those little cream ice creams that they dip in chocolate? And we'd get one of those, and we'd sit in this hot car in that hot heat in Florida and lick. I mean, you couldn't lick quick enough to keep that chocolate from falling off, but we enjoyed it. In that little special corner, they had these little square buns that you'd get hot dogs in. My, 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 times change, don't they? But memories, we made memories. And it's nice to think about your memories. You know, John and I have a memory book a real personal. I can share with you today about memories, but John and I have a memory book that nobody knows about. Women, this is something we all, and men, you need to know that you don't tell everything. You have personal things that you don't tell anybody. Uh, and John and I always call that our memory book makes me almost want to cry because I got so many memories, so many special memories that I think about that I never share with anybody except him. And then when you get in the sunset, the winter of your life, the book's really big. And sometimes when you get this age, people just say, oh, they're getting old, they just don't remember. You know what? I want to remember the good things. Everything that comes up on the screen of my mind today, I don't want to remember. But I do want to remember all of these beautiful, beautiful personal things. Oh, just riding in a car. We like to ride in cars. We just like to roll the windows up, turn on our 50s music, and go down the road and listen to, maybe you don't like this, but I like the bebop music. And we would listen to that. Memories, just memories. Start to build your own memory book. It's never too late. Maybe you've never thought about that. But some of you want to know nice things to, at my age to remember. I would say this, build your personal memory book. No best girlfriend, nobody in the church, no child, nobody. Just walk this beautiful love story in front of people. Let it be true. Be true to yourself. Well, now that's another key. Build your personal memory book. And... Uh, you know what I think causes a lot of problems in marriage is money. There'll be one in the marriage that's real careful with money. And the other one is a little bit, what would I say, freer to spend. And sometimes, oh, we've had cars. We've had cars. I mean, we've had antique cars. We've had modern cars. You know what? 
one time, John used to kind of, oh, I'm not going to say that. It wasn't done mount to anything, but they were cars. Somebody said to John one time, he changes cars like we change underwear. Because, and, uh, houses. I mean, I've got a son that lives next door to me where I'm living now. You know, he's living in that house 25 years. I've never lived in a house 25 years. The longest I ever lived in a house was 10. Where I live right now, I've lived four, and that's maxing it out for me to ever live in a place four years. You say, well, did you lose the houses? No. My husband always wanted to give me nicer and give me nicer and bigger and bigger. That one time he went in this house, and I stood as he went through the house. It was so big. It looked like, it looked kind of like an embassy suite with that second floor. It had that boundary borders or with all of those boundaries. And down here was two stories and make a big room out of it and do television. Oh, my golly. You know what I did? I stood at one end of that house and I cried. I thought, oh, God, don't let him buy this house. We don't need anything like this. And we never did. When we had needed the bigger houses, we had all those kiddos, but we didn't have the bigger houses then. Today we live in a little house, nice little house, nice furniture. But it's not very big at all. But you know what? This is a key. Learn to be content in whatever state you're in. Money's never going to make you happy. Love's going to make you happy. Communication's going to make you happy. Uh, respecting each other's going to make you happy. Oh, I will tell you, as you go through life, you cannot go through life without getting some... Marriage, too, without getting some skinned-up knees... <laughs> And I'm not going to say a black eye because I don't believe that comes from hitting. But sometimes you fall. You fall in a ditch. You fall and you get a bruise. You can't go through marriage without getting some of those. Don't blame each other. Stop and think about, yes, he got this angry or she got this angry, but did I cause some of it? Not all of it. One of you will have a hotter temper, and no, and by the time you've been together a while, you know which buttons to push to make the problem happen. Learn not to push those buttons. Learn control. You know, the fruits of the Spirit talk about that. Long suffering. Maybe you've got something you want to talk about, but maybe it's not the time. And don't pray for patience. Just learn to just... I prayed for patience so long, and I've had so much tribulation that I don't pray for patience. I just learn there's going to come a time, I can say this, and it's going to be the right time, and I'm not going to have any problems. Yes, maybe I don't like this the very best, but... You know, John's got a cologne he wears, and I like that cologne. It, he's been wearing it for so long, and I can get in a room, and I can sniff the men out that have that cologne on. One time I was going down the aisle of the church, and John was gone during this period of time, and I was pastoring a church, and I walked down the aisle. Wow, I had to stop. I said, you've got such and such a perfume on. Yes, I knew it. But you know what? He's got other perfumes, but when he's around me, he puts that one on. And you know, one time I told him how nice he looked in this blue shirt. I didn't think he was ever going to take that shirt off. <laughs> Even for time for me to wash. Now, those are just little, little tidbits to let you know that there are some keys Every key you've got on your key ring won't make 
every car start, make your car start. You've got all kinds of keys. And see, you have to take what I'm saying and you have to put it around because you know what? God is a potter and we're the clay. And he's made me this way and he's made you that way. So I can say things a certain way, but you know what? They, your, your vase may be made a little bit different and your, your husband may be a little different. So you have to take what I say to you about my life and you have to work it around to where it fits your life. I'm just giving you some things that I've learned that worked in my life. And I will tell you this is another one. Oh, we wanted children. We had four children in four and a half years. But you know what? There were, And I can't say we ever really afforded any of them, could afford any of them. But you know what? Every time we were so thrilled, we never had a child that we weren't elated about. Oh, we're pregnant. Oh, good, good. Even to the point we had to take three diapers sometimes to make one diaper because they got a little holy, not righteous, holy, you know, oh, oh, oh. Anyway, we could make one diaper. Boy, John learned to tie those diapers on that no matter what was in that diaper, it wasn't getting out. He knew how to twist it and tie it. He was good. He was honestly one of the best men to be a husband, to be a father in those ways. I kind of raised the kids, the first four, because he was working and I was raising kids. But we'll talk about kids another time. But we learned this about our children. Our children, no matter how many we had, they came to go. They weren't going to stay with us till this age. And so we brought them up. We loved them. We let them have their years of developing. Maybe, maybe sometimes we squeezed a little tight. Maybe sometimes we didn't squeeze tight enough. But anyway... They're all grown now, and John and I have still got each other, and we're still madly in love with each other. You know, after all of these years and half of our marriage, he's been traveling. He's been out in your churches. He's been out with the body of Christ. But you know what? Oh, 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 how we love each other. And how I praise God for technology. Because right now, as I make this, he's over in Asia. But you know what? I talk to him every day, possibly twice a day. And I see him. You can do it FaceTime. Is that what he's called? FaceTime. And I can look at him, and he can look at me. And sometimes if I'm not all fixed up, I don't want him to see me. So I lean over so he can't get my picture. Anyway. That's some of the keys I know that have helped John and I with making our marriage good. Just keep working on it. Keep working on it. Don't, get, don't give up. And when you come to the winter of your life, you'll have a life like I have. You'll have a memory book that is so full of things nobody in the world knows. And whether he goes first or I go first, nobody can take my memory book away from me. Start to build your memory book. You will never regret it. Excellent, Mom Pat. Thank you. We're going to ask one more on this. And what is an effective way that you've learned or that you can share with us to support your husband? What's a good way for a wife to be able to support her husband? Well, being opposite, it, this goes a long ways. Respect, remember, respect. You have to respect your husband. You want to respect your husband because you want a good life. 
And that's the only way it happens, if you respect each other. There's several ways to answer this. Sometimes uh, you're going to find yourself, as I did, in all kinds of situations. Life is different than when I raised my children. A lot of times now, both parents work. And um, I raised my children to the fifth one was, um, he was in the third grade and I went to work in the church. But up to that time, I had helped my husband, but I never really worked in, in the church and was there every day helping with things. So there's a difference. If you are a woman at home and your husband goes out to work every day, I know you have a lot of work at home. I know if you have children, you have a lot to do, but you both have got jobs. You maybe think yours isn't important because you don't get a paycheck every time because you are taking care of children, you're cooking meals, you're doing clothes, you're doing lots of things. Even more than sometimes some of these conferences tell you to do. They tell the women sometimes, don't do things that are your husband's duties. Let me tell you, if your husband's out doing all he can to make a living, he's going to pay for your rent, your mortgage, your car, your clothes, your food, everything that allows you to take care of the home. So there again, respect. I think in this case, what I did is I tried to take care of everything I could at home and support him. Another key about supporting your husband, don't ever belittle your husband. Some women, some of you, and some of us have strong personalities. And we could just override our husband and make him feel like a dog that wanted to tuck his tail between his legs and run off. But he can't run off. He has to sit right there and face some of this belittlement. Don't ever, husbands, don't belittle your wife. And wife, don't belittle your husband. That will cause them to crumble. They need to be feel like you're behind them, even if they're doing something that you don't really approve of. Wait till you're alone and share with them what you did not approve of that they did. Because you're going to hurt their manliness. It's very, very important that your husband remains manly. And whatever it takes to make your husband manly, do it. Do it. Can I just tell you a little thing that I watched on the TV the other day? This woman had married this man, and I can't remember his first name. It might have, but his last name was Hawkins. And he got that disease, ALS, that's a horrible disease. And that man became all crippled up in a wheelchair. Just crippled. It was all like this. And his fingers were shriveled up. And he could hardly talk. And he wore glasses. But you know what I saw through that? I saw that woman took care of him. She took care of him. She made him feel good. Now, it went on, and I, that's just the only part of the story I want to tell about. But the thing of that was, was that even in his crippled condition, she respected him, and she treated him with honor. And she spoke to those doctors when they said he was going to die, take him off the respirators, she challenged him. No, he's going to live. We're taking him here, and he's going to live. And you know, he did live. 
He ended up writing books, and he sold 10 million of the books. But if he would have had a woman that belittled him in that crippled up, twisted, snarled stage, you know what? He would have never been able to do that. She would have crushed his manhood. So don't ever belittle your husband. And you know what? What we sow, we're going to reap. If you sow lifting him up and honoring him, let me tell you, that husband will do the same for you. Maybe it doesn't happen instantly because you got to plant the crop. Sow it, sow it, sow it. And then it's the little sprigs start to come up. And before you know it, you've planted so much seed of being kind and respectful and honoring that you've got a great big tree here that just wants to protect you, shade you, honor you, give you good stuff. Oh, that's good, even if I say so myself. That is real you know, good. That makes us all just want to, you know, we women are, we're kind of teary-eyed sometimes. Emotions are good. Don't ever hide them. You know what? I've never had the prettiest hands, but they haven't always had arthritis and been crooked. But even though I didn't have the prettiest hands, my husband would take my hands, and you know what he would say? These are working hands. I know what these hands do. They are beautiful to me. And you know what the Bible says? Beautiful are the feet of those that preach the gospel. My, my, my. I don't get around real good, but I'm sitting here talking to you about the things of the Lord. I use a cane sometimes. This foot's going to get fixed, whatever it is. But anyway, I can still share the word with you. I can share the glorious things of how to be the woman you need to be, or the man, if you happen to hear this, the man you need to be. If she's sowing good things in your life, you just know that she's going to water that seed. She's going to bring that seed till it comes to full growth, and that's you. Thank you. I love you. I love getting to share with you my life.